Hi. I'm Dr. Anna Hurst, and I'm a clinical geneticist in the Department of Genetics at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Today I'll be talking to you about which of your patients may benefit from referral to clinical genetic services. Obviously this is not meant to provide a comprehensive list, but we hope that it will provide primary care providers and subspecialists with overall guidance as they consider who may benefit from genetics evaluation. Genetic specialists evaluate patients who are personally affected by or at risk for a genetic disorder, and that can be due to either their personal medical conditions or a family medical history. Genetic conditions are broad and can reach across all organ systems and may affect individuals across their lifespan. One of my favorite aspects of being a geneticist is the fact that we can see entire families and patients of all ages from the prenatal period through infancy, childhood, and adulthood. During evaluation, patients may meet with a medical geneticist and or a genetic counselor to review their personal and family history, and they may perform a comprehensive physical exam for phenotyping. This may reveal a specific condition for which more focused genetic testing can be performed. Let's think about when a geneticist may encounter patients, beginning with the preconception and prenatal period. Individuals who have a personal or family history of a genetic condition may like to know what the chances are of their future children having the same condition. Couples may also seek preconception carrier screening for a variety of conditions that may impact the pregnancy. Couples or individuals who have three or more pregnancy losses, either miscarriages or stillbirths, may benefit from genetic testing via a karyotype to rule out chromosome translocations as a source. During a pregnancy, there are opportunities for genetic screening for common chromosome aneuploidies and birth defects like neural tube defects. This can be using screening, ultrasound measurements, and blood samples from the mother. Different types of testing may be offered based upon a patient's age or prior history. If this initial screening reveals an increased chance of an affected pregnancy, further testing with blood tests or ultrasounds may be recommended. To confirm a genetic diagnosis prenatally, an invasive procedure such as chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis may be offered. People concerned that their jobs, lifestyle, or medical history may pose a risk to the outcome of a pregnancy may meet with a genetic counselor for discussion of risk. Common causes of concern include exposure to radiation, medication, illicit drugs, chemicals, or infections. Let's think about a common prenatal case scenario. A couple is considering a pregnancy and they come to a genetics provider because the man's brother has a history of cystic fibrosis, an autosomal recessive genetic condition. In this case, he should probably be referred to a prenatal genetic counselor and not the geneticist first, as a physical exam is likely not necessary. In this case, the primary role of the genetics team is to perform an accurate risk assessment for himself and for the pregnancy and then to order appropriate genetic testing. As cystic fibrosis is a recessive condition, both of his parents are likely carriers, but he tells you that he himself has never been tested. He was told his whole life that the chance of him being a carrier is a half because he learned about Punnett squares and he knows if both parents are carriers, the types of offspring combinations could be 25% homozygous for the normal allele, 25% homozygous for the affected allele leading to cystic fibrosis, or 50% heterozygous carriers. And while that's accurate, his chances are slightly different. And in meeting with the genetics team, they inform him that because they know he's not affected, the chance of him being a carrier is actually two thirds. When he hears that information, he's more interested in his chance of being a carrier and wants to pursue genetic testing. The next step is then determining what test is appropriate. And this largely depends on what genetic variant his brother has causing cystic fibrosis. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of different unique variations in the CFTR gene that can cause the gene to not work properly, and some of these are unique to individual families. If a common routine carrier panel is sent, this may only detect 23 or 40 of the most common variants, and this may not be useful to detect the allele found in his family. If negative, the man can be falsely reassured that he's not a carrier, when in fact, he just wasn't tested for the right variant. It would be important to obtain records or test the affected family member first to ensure that future family members have the right test ordered to be the most accurate and most informative. 
Another common reason for patients of all ages to come to the geneticist is for diagnosis and medical management of rare diseases and syndromes. This is not an exhaustive list, but when speaking broadly about my job, I tell families I'm a doctor who helps people who have anything different about how they learn, grow, or develop. When we think about individuals who have physical or health differences that may be genetic, including things like physical birth defects, we're especially interested in seeing people who have two or more major organ malformations. Also, individuals who have developmental delay or intellectual disabilities should be referred, as there could be a genetic component to their condition. Features on a physical exam can also be a clue to a unifying diagnosis. These features may be findings like facial features atypical for the family or unusual growth patterns such as undergrowth in a child with failure to thrive, overgrowth, or asymmetric growth in someone with hemihyperplasia. There's also a wide range of medical conditions that can have a genetic basis. This could be findings like congenital hearing loss, neurologic diagnoses such as seizures, ataxia, hypotonia, or abnormal MRI findings, or in cardiology, conditions like non-viral cardiomyopathy or hereditary arrhythmias. People may also come to genetics clinic when there's a positive newborn screening result for an inborn error of metabolism, like phenylketonuria, PKU, or medium chain acyl-CoA dehydrogenase deficiency, also known as MCAD. Although these conditions are individually rare, many people in Alabama have had their lives saved and health outcomes improved by early detection with newborn screening. If a diagnosis is suspected, a geneticist can then confirm the diagnosis either through clinical exam or specialized testing. People who have a known genetic diagnosis benefit from seeing genetics providers on a regular basis for medical management, prognostication, discussion about counseling and inheritance, and recurrence risk. When there's a family history of a condition, individuals may come for testing of the known variant. Or if the test result or their affected family member is unavailable, the team can have a discussion about who would be the best person to test and what the potential benefits and limitations of testing are. An example of this from a recent clinic visit is when I saw two sisters, age six and four. They came with their mother, who informed us of a strong paternal family history of hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia, an autosomal dominant genetic condition. Their father hasn't had symptoms, such as nosebleeds, but he has never been tested and does not currently have insurance. Although it would be ideal to test him first, sometimes it's not practically or financially possible. A large part of our conversation centered about who should be tested in the family and what the implications of positive or negative testing would be. It's often recommended that we not test minors for conditions which have onset only in the adult years. However, HHT is different. This is a serious condition which can have childhood manifestations. Screening recommendations suggest a head MRI to detect cerebral arteriovenous malformations as early as possible, even in the first year of life. So because there are health recommendations that would affect the girls' management, we felt it was important to go ahead and offer genetic testing for them and not wait on their father's insurance status to change. Fortunately, the family had documentation of their relative's specific DNA misspelling in the ENG gene that leads to HHT in their family, and that means instead of spending thousands of dollars on testing, we could send testing for a few hundred dollars focused on looking at just one area of the DNA. We were able to test the girls with a caveat that if one of the daughters is positive, this would mean that their father is also positive and an obligate-affected individual. However, if the girls are both negative, this would not tell us anything about their father's status as he still may be affected with no symptoms appearing yet. Another area where genetic testing is becoming more integral to healthcare management is the field of cancer. The American College of Medical Genetics and the National Society of Genetic Counselors issued a practice guideline in 2015 that outlined indication for referral for cancer predisposition assessment. Although not exhaustive, we will discuss a few of the red flags or early signs of a patient who may benefit from a detailed discussion with a genetics professional. These can include people who have features such as bilateral cancers or two primary cancers together in the same patient. Individuals with an early age of onset, which for adults is typically less than 50, should be considered for referral. For pediatric cancer patients, it may depend on the cancer type. 
For some types of cancers, a genetics evaluation is always recommended, such as any case of ovarian, pancreatic, medullary thyroid cancers, and adrenocortical carcinomas. You should also consider a genetics referral for someone who has a rare or atypical cancer, like male breast cancer, in themselves or a first-degree family member. Family history is extremely important. We look for individuals who have multiple family members on the same side of the family with the same or related cancers. We often remind patients that both maternal and paternal history matters, even for cancers that typically affect one sex. Since you get half your genes from your mom and half from dad, a family history of multiple relatives with breast cancer on your father's side of the family is just as important as one on your mother's. We also evaluate individuals who have a known cancer predisposition variant in their family and want testing for that condition. Family ancestry can be a useful guide, as some populations of individuals may have a higher chance of carrying specific genetics variants, such as those in the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry population. In some cases, there are external physical features, which could be a clue to a cancer predisposition syndrome in a patient. These can include congenital anomalies, dysmorphic facial findings, developmental delay and in intellectual disability, or autism spectrum disorders. Unusual body growth patterns, such as macrocephaly, could be indicative of syndromes like Cowden syndrome or nevoid basal cell carcinoma syndrome. Some syndromes are associated with characteristic skin changes, such as oral papillomas, spotty pigmentation on the lips and mucosa, cutaneous leiomyomas, and multiple cafe au lait macules. In some cases, non-cancerous growths may be an early clue to a later increased risk for cancer, such as the presence of 10 or more adenomatous polyps or juvenile polyps. A common reason for someone to come to Cancer Genetics Clinic may be to discuss someone's family history of cancer. Here, the arrow points to a 20-year-old woman who reports three individuals in her family who have early onset colorectal cancer. The affected individuals are her maternal grandmother, maternal uncle, and his daughter. The genetics provider would have a detailed discussion with her about the most appropriate candidate for genetic testing. Ideally, genetic testing should start in an individual who they themselves are affected by the condition. Because if we can't find a genetic reason for cancer in that person, then testing is unlikely to be useful in other family members. In this case, her grandmother is deceased. However, if her maternal uncle is still living and open to testing, it may be best for him to first have an evaluation and consider testing and share those results with other members in the family. If it's not possible to obtain testing in a family member, it may be better for our patient's mother to come in for testing, as she is more closely related to the affected individuals than our 20-year-old patient is. If we test an unaffected individual, we must be cautious because a negative result in them may be uninformative and not completely reassuring. This is because we don't know if the selected test included the predisposing genes that was affecting the other family members. If we didn't test the correct gene, the test we sent would not be useful. It may also be helpful in these situations to obtain pathology records from the affected individuals and look for mismatch repair deficiency on tumor testing. Genetic test selection is becoming more complex every day. Over 75,000 tests are on the market with 10 new tests added daily. Currently, clinical genetic testing is best to explain the genetic contribution to existing health problems for known genetic conditions. While there are a variety of tests marketed directly to consumers, we urge caution because those tests may not be clinically validated to warrant any medical decisions based on the findings. So it is extremely important to select the right test for the right patient and to consider the key issues which we previously outlined, such as which family member is the best first candidate for testing, what are the attributes of the test, such as which gene or variants are included, what is the methodology, and the sensitivity. It's also important to know limitations of any test you are selecting. Cost and insurance coverage can be a major driver of test selection and if a provider sends testing not covered by insurance, the patient may be responsible for the cost, which can be hundreds or even thousands of dollars. It's always recommended to perform a benefits investigation and consider the out-of-pocket cost to a patient before sending testing. One of the more advanced genetic tests you may hear about is exome and genome sequencing. For more details on this process, you can see the MD Learning presentation on this topic separately. Ideal candidates for exome and genome sequencing are those affected by an undiagnosed, 
likely genetic condition, but for whom initial genetic testing has been unrevealing. Individuals should have clear features with discrete clinical indications because the phenotypic information is given to the laboratory analyzing the information, and without knowing the reason for sending the test, the lab wouldn't know which variants and which genes are the most appropriate to return. Broad-based sequencing can be useful if there is a wide differential diagnosis, as it allows for multiple genes to be investigated simultaneously. It's also helpful to submit available family controls, including samples from first-degree family members, whose results can be used to segregate the data and determine if a variant found in the patient is inherited or new in them. People undergoing exome or genome sequencing should have extensive pretest counseling because there's the chance of finding secondary variants, those of medical significance but not related to the initial reason for sending the test. For example, sending a test on a child with seizures may reveal a pathogenic variant in a breast cancer predisposition gene. Families can opt in or opt out of receiving this information, but there are many factors to consider in making this choice. Geneticists and genetic counselors are equipped to have a thorough conversation about the impact of this decision when consenting the family before sending testing. Currently in routine clinical care, we do not recommend genome sequencing to asymptomatic individuals. Genome sequencing is most useful in the diagnosis of rare diseases. Consider the case of a three-year-old female with developmental delays and low muscle tone. She has a history of failure to thrive and microcephaly. On exam, she has spasticity and dysmorphic facial features. An MRI showed hypoplasia of the corpus callosum. First-year genetic testing, including microarray and fragile X, was unrevealing. At this point, the differential was so broad that the genetics team felt it was best to send a broad-based test, such as exome sequencing. This revealed a de novo, meaning not inherited, variant in the DDX3X gene. The specific nomenclature indicates that at DNA letter number 1175, what should be a letter T for nucleotide, is changed to C. This one nucleotide change leads to an incorrect amino acid at position number 392, where what should be a leucine becomes a proline. This causes the gene to not work properly and led to her medical features. Her features were nonspecific enough where the clinical team would not have considered single gene testing for this condition, and a broad-based approach would be the only way to find a diagnosis for her. Now she has a confirmed diagnosis, and having this appropriate diagnosis is extremely important for her medical care and planning. It's been demonstrated that for patients with rare conditions who receive a diagnosis, there are direct management changes in 30% of cases. One of the biggest psychosocial benefits to families is that it ends their diagnostic odyssey, or the process of searching and searching for answers. This can actually decrease medical cost because their care becomes more targeted to the specific needs of the individual. Having a known genetic diagnosis is important for families who may be curious about reproductive and recurrence information. In the prior case, since the variant was de novo or not inherited, the parent's recurrence risk is less than 1% for future children. However, in other conditions, the recurrence risk could be 25% or as high as 50%, and we're unable to give exact recurrence information without knowing the basis of the condition. Genome and exome sequencing is also advancing what the scientific community knows about the genetic contributions to health. In summary, there are a variety of forms of genetic testing which can be useful for patients across the lifespan for many indications. Selecting the right test for the right patient is crucial, and because of the complexity, we encourage you to contact a professional if you have questions about your patient's specific situation. Clinical geneticists are available to evaluate patients, select and interpret tests, and provide medical management based on these results.